So Bear, how did you get started with GMG? Um, I started working for him when I was 13. <clears throat> My father was the ranch manager and uh, at that point in life I spent a lot of time with him on the summers and uh, I was living in Pennsylvania. I'd go in to Oklahoma for the summers where my dad lived. In 1998, he got a job offer to go work for Ben, and Ben was recruiting him pretty hard over a few years, and he finally just committed to going in and uh, looking at the job in fall of 98. So um, early winter, late fall of 98, he took the job and uh, moved into Virginia, which was about four hours away from where I lived at the time, three hours away. It was a pretty exciting time for me. I was the closest my dad's ever lived to me. And uh, so I went down, spent summers working on G&G, spring breaks, Christmas breaks, things like that. Um, when my dad retired, uh, which I was 18 when he did, um, I went a different direction. I worked for Rob Fenza in Pennsylvania, working on his Longhorn Ranch. And um, I worked for a couple construction companies, some internships and had another business and when uh, I think it was May of 2009 Ralph Fenza called me one day and said he was just leaving Gravis and that I needed to go talk to him so uh, I had an opening one morning I got up at 3 a.m. and drove down to Virginia met Ben at 8 and did a little me him looked at the job talked to him about it and uh, he t told me he needed a know in a couple weeks and before I left I knew I, I wanted to be there so when you met with Ben mm -hmm. what what made you how did you know that you were supposed to be there I mean I guess it's kind of funny to say but it's like everything I've done in my life has given me skills and abilities to be the best I can at, at this job um, everything from learning how to run a weed eater to uh, <laughs> walking through poison ivy without getting attacked by it um fixing fence lines you know putting a, a schedule together putting a budget together um putting some type of management plan together everything that i've done leading up to working here seemed to give me some type of skills that allow me to excel in this job and i mean since i was a little kid all i ever wanted to be was a cowboy i think that's at some point every little kid wants to be that I was just extremely fortunate to have my father as one, and um, I mean, it's it's a dream I think most men never never lose, and it's one that I get to live every day. So do you think your dad being the range manager before you had anything to do with it? Mm, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it's nice to have somebody who's been where you want to go to give you some type of advice or, or show you how to get to where you want to be having my father in the industry you know I had all the resources and outlets that I needed to to get to where I wanted to go I mean I had contacts and people that that knew me and that I knew and it was once once it was decided I wanted to do this it was it was easy to get into it so for the people that don't know Ben passed away you know there's been a transition period mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about what hands goals are or how the program's changed a little when Ben passed away, it was, uh, I mean, it was probably as much a learning experience for her as it was for me, because, um, you know, I was worried. I didn't know what, what was going on or if she wanted to keep the cows or not keep the cows, because it's a lot of work. And um, I knew what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be. I, I wasn't leaving G&G, &G. They're, they're family to me. And uh, when Ben was sick, I mean, she made it a point to tell me that that nothing was going to happen without her talking to me so there was some security there and um after he passed you know she made it a point to let me know that we weren't going anywhere that they worked too hard to get to their program to where it was too much time and effort into it and uh you know we're just not going to drop ben like that and you know he was somebody that outside of my family influenced me more than anybody ever has um He's somebody that I think about every day, and I mean it's hard not to when, you know, when you're out amongst the cows. And uh, somebody I miss more and more. I miss more today than I did yesterday, and I'll miss more tomorrow than I do today. Um, but she, I mean, she never blinked, and you, I never knew how strong a person she was until I saw her going through, you know, with with Ben being sick and, and Ben dying. Um, 
you know, and this is this is a business for us. This isn't a necessarily a hobby. This is how we make money. Um, so she's a lot less or a lot more logical than what Ben was. You know, Ben was had made very emotional decisions, and her goal is just to to keep being G&G strong and keep building our our herd and, and our program and and developing markets and in the east and bringing new breeders in and um, you know helping people establish themselves and uh, help them find success. So with all that, G and G starting a new chapter. Pretty much, You're yeah. Moving, I mean, we're right? moving, yeah. So uh, I mean, a moving's pretty exciting uh, and terrifying all at the same time. So we've been in Catlett since uh, I think '92. Uh, this summer and purchased a place in uh, Madison County, Virginia, Central Virginia that we're, you know, we're in a process of moving to and getting fence built and everything like, you know, that entails that, that big a move and it's uh, it's awesome because her and I get to design the, the flow of the ranch that, that we want, whereas the ranch we're working at now is, is one that my dad and Ben did, so um, it's kind of like the next generation of, of G and G, and you know who else to follow than than the greats of my father and and Ben. So outside of Longhorns, you have any hobbies? <laughs> Only one really. Um, you know, I live on the land that we work, so um, you know most of my show, social experiences revolve around coming to Longhorn events and and my passion for hunting. So uh, Longhorns and and chasing critters is. Pretty much all that I do. So what's um, the hardest thing to hunt? <laughs> depends on what you want. I tell you, when I went to Colorado or not Colorado, Canada with Jess Jesperson, he took me coyote hunting. I thought that was going to be like not necessarily shooting fish in a barrel, but you watch it on TV, you call the coyotes and you shoot them. Um, walking through knee deep and thigh deep snow with uh, the Jesperson boys, who uh, not very many people have ever really hunted with them, but kind of the process is, is one guy breaks a trail and the other two follow suit and kind of walk in the same footprints as those guys. Well, John and Jeff's stride is about six inches longer than mine, so I couldn't really keep up with them. It kicked my tail. We chase a lot of grouse in Pennsylvania and Virginia, um, something that we hunt with the dogs and, you know, I got two labs that I love to death. So that's something that, that those two dogs and I have been chasing for about 10 years. Uh, and they're they're pretty hard to shoot. If you think you can shoot a shotgun, uh, try grouse hunting, and we'll see if you can shoot or not. We took took Nick uh, cots up from Lonesome Pine Ranch, uh, bear hunting and grouse hunting, and uh, you know he was Nick's a good shot. He's he's a gunman. He knows how to operate a firearm. But uh, we take him there, and the the grouse hunting kicked his butt. So he won't tell you that, but I'll tell you that he's kind of walking around with the gun on his shoulder, not ready, and all of a sudden they just blow out of the bushes. And if you're if you're not ready on the trigger, you're you're just gonna watch them fly away. So but, you're saying you're a pretty good shot. Yeah, let's go. So yeah, I'm a really good shot. You're up for a competition. Yep. All right. Well, we gotta have a bet go. then. I like the bet. What do you got? So if you lose, you have to wear higher hand apparel at the next event. Like a hat. Like a hat or shirt or something. Okay. And if we lose, we have to wear East Wind okay. apparel. I just have hats right now. It's fine. But you have to use your left hand. malfunction or operator malfunction. Shut up! Shut up! <laughs>
left-handed with a handgun. And they're shooting scoped rifles. The smell of black powder is always a good time. So, on East Wind's kind of been a, the idea has been in the making for a while. We, uh, East Coast market's a lot different than everywhere else, but probably a lot similar too, to a lot of the niche markets outside of the Texas, Oklahoma area. Um, we spent a lot of time helping people. And for me, it was a lot easier for me to go help people's program, whether it was just give some advice on breeding, on buying, on feed programs, on working pen setup than it was to not and have them get frustrated, get out of the business, and then us have to cultivate new breeders to bring in. So, um, and that was something Ben and Ann always let me do was take weekends after work, doing work, whatever was needed to go and spend time with these people and, um, you know, just help them feel uh, comfortable, um, feel that what they were doing was was the right way was the right direction without making mistakes and, and costing them a lot of money so uh, it really came to in the uh, summer of 2009 last summer and um, oh my god it was live real at the whole day in Pennsylvania just talking to a breeder and the breeder needed some help trying to move some cows didn't know whether to keep some sell some which ones he needed to get rid of call wise um, just pasture layout so we spent like eight hours up there on a Saturday um, with him and uh, kind of put together a little plan and the good news was within a week they were finding success um, they sold cattle just by simple marketing things just putting a sign up in their yard for cattle for sale uh, that week with people driving by they called some cattle and um, you know I really tried to give unbiased opinion but um, you know, I also wanted to build relationships because the whole industry is based off of this, these relationships. With the, the 10 programs that I was working with, they, they all kind of have different backgrounds. Um, you know, something from somebody who's already established, uh, like Gillian Ranch and, um, you know, Mark and his wife, they, they use Justin Rombeck as a consultant too, so they actually have two consultants. Um, and then, you know, kind of go to the other end of the spectrum with Dale Smith and Lago Haven, and he's have a much smaller breeder and, and a little bit newer to the industry and need some help. Um, John and Christine Talley who have a, a goal in mind but they just want to skip uh, any type of problems that they may find and may come across that'll slow down the time frame to their goal. Um, to T Bar W who wanted to put on a production sale and uh, you know so everybody kind of had a, a different idea of where they wanted to go which is something that I'm really proud of because I don't want all the programs to look like the same program that I'm working with. So where do you see it going in the future? whole goal with Eastwin, I guess, is to keep people in the industry and help them find success. As far as the future, um, just kind of keep doing what I'm doing. I'm, I really hope my customers are finding success and, um, you know, getting out of Eastwin what, what we initially started and the reason why I started because each customer is different. I, I sit down with every customer or phone call usually because of our location and really just talk to them and see what they they think they need within their program. And basically I just customize my approach to uh, a plan based off of what they think they need and what I think I can help them with. So if you had to pick just one, one piece of advice, um, even though you're really knowledgeable in all aspects of breeding programs, what would be the best advice you think you can give? I mean, for new breeders, I think the biggest thing is is just take your time. Um, it can happen quick. You can go from a couple cows to, to 25 cows really, really fast. And next thing you know, you got a bull out there and you go from 25 cows to 35 cows to 55 cows in a couple years. Um, so take your time and talk to everybody. Talk to every single person. Don't You, you don't want to get under under one single person you want to go out there and and see what what'll work for you and where you want to go um, 
because if you if you copy a program, you'll always be second best. Um, and this industry is such a relationship-based industry. People, you know, want to know your name, want to know your ranch name, want to know your cow name. So the more you can get out there, the more you can talk to people, the more that you can establish yourself as a quality person, uh, the better you're going to be. Is there anything else you want to share you want folks to know about either g and or Eastland or just Longbirds in general? We just, we absolutely love this industry. I mean, this is... This isn't a hobby for us. This isn't something we do on on the weekends or or on you know after work. We're extremely fortunate enough that this is our entire livelihood, and the Longhorn industry and its successes and its failures affect us in every step of the way. Um, we just want to see the the Longhorn world succeed in in every way possible. We want every breeder to find success with his breeding program and, and with their sale consignments and with their private treaty sales because. When, when that happens, the industry gets better and we, we're all going to grow and we're all going to benefit from it. So. Well, thanks for joining us. You bet. Thanks for letting me be you guys at Shooting Guns. <laughs> it's fun. Pew, pew, pew.